He'd left a dime on the stoop to pay for whatever we could find to steal, which was always little enough. That was something to see, my father in his shirt sleeves straddling a rickety old garden fence with a hank of carrot tops in his hand and a fellow behind him taking aim. We took off into the brush, and when we decided he wasn't going to follow us, we sat down on the ground, and my father scraped the dirt off the carrot with his knife and cut it up into pieces and set them on the crown of his hat, which he'd put between us like a table. And then he commenced to say grace, which he never failed to do. He said, for all that we are about to receive. And then we both started laughing till the tears were pouring down. So I wonder, how, how do you do that? How do you inhabit these characters so beautifully and so realistically? You've never been a father. You've never been a son. <laughs> Housekeeping is about two sisters. You don't have a sister. H how do you do this? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um... They inhabit me. That's more the experience. You know. <laughs> I don't actually invent a character. I, I, I realize that a character is already in my mind. Um, in the absence of that, I can't write a novel. And uh, when that is true, I enjoy writing a novel, you know? It's very much a feeling of... Uh, being alert to a voice that I hear in my mind that is not my own voice. I wouldn't believe it if it were. The Guardian included Gilead on a list of um, books to give you hope. Do you set out to give people hope with your writing? I would hate to think that anyone's hope was diminished by anything that I had written. <laughs> I. Um, I, I, I just do think that human life and human society are, are beautiful things, poignant things, things deserving of, of loyalty and attention. Um, and I suppose that that does imply hope. Um, but I think hope is appropriate. Um, I think that uh, the opposite of hope is defeat. You know? Your newest book is a collection of essays, The Givenness of Things. And these essays are lectures you've, you've given, is that correct? Yeah. Um, they seem very prescient, um, especially given our, our current political climate, um, and particularly the essay about fear and how it intersects with Christianity um, and how the two almost at times exploit each other? Is that accurate? You don't have a microphone. <laughs> um, well, well, you say that um, as fear is not actually a Christian habit of mind, and you say as Christians we are to believe that we are to fear not the death of our bodies, but the loss of our souls. You know, I, I think that's absolutely axiomatic. <laughs> I mean, I think I could quote chapter and verse. But the, um, the thing that bothers me when I see fear becoming a sort of, uh, it's almost like some kind of craze that has swept through the culture, you know? Um, and the thing about fear is that it deprives you of the possibility of acting generously toward anyone that you might fear, anybody that has been described to you as being other from you or, or hostile to your interests in some way or, or lacking in respect of demographic sort. Um, I don't think, I, I think that, a per, I mean, you are supposed to trust God, which includes trusting the fact that if it's your time to die, it's your time to die, you know? But then there's also the fact that uh, you, you know, we, we become suspicious, we become inclined not to accept anything, no matter how graciously intended, as being meant in good faith. All these things are consequences of fear. And if you 
subscribe to this habit of mind, you have completely disabled you yourself in terms of behaving in the way that Christians are supposed to act. You told President Obama in the, the interview that Bruce Dold brought up, I think that the basis of democracy is the willingness to assume well about other people. Um, so have we moved away from, from that? Um, well, yes, I would say we have moved away from that. Um, this sort of polarization that people talk about, which is, is antagonism, really. It's moved beyond simply, I really don't agree with you, to I have the deepest doubts about your human worth, you know? Well, yes, I would say that that's true. And there are all sorts of things, again, that are affected by that, you know? For example, we've gone into some sort of strange crisis about educating. Um, we've, which is something we have done passionately and well for hundreds of years. It's a defining trait in this civilization. Education, when it's good, is undertaken with the idea that the people are liberated, expanded, that you, give, you open new possibilities of, of pleasure and understanding to people, you know. Um, we don't define it that way anymore. We talk about it in terms of, of making you fit into the economy that needs certain kinds of cogs, you know, even very highly developed, highly sophisticated cogs. Um, I think that if we had a more respectful attitude toward people in general, we would be much more generous and hopeful and energetic in educating them than currently we are. Uh, that reminds me of a quote I wrote down that you said to the New York Times. Um, you were talking about your own childhood, and you said, we were positively encouraged to create for ourselves minds we would want to live with. I had teachers articulate that to me. You have to live with your mind your whole life. You build your mind, so make it into something you want to live with. You said, nobody has ever said anything more valuable to me. Well, that's simply true. I mean, those really are, I suppose if there are words I have lived by, those are words I have lived by. The, the idea that, you know, that there's something special to you for whatever reason that you really need to know, not because it's any kind of, you know, necessity that would be uh, recognizable to other people, but because it would feel good to have that resource in your mind. It would, you know, uh, it would enhance your passage through time. Simply, I, I, I made a promise to myself at a certain point that I will certainly crashingly break, which is that I would not die stupid. <laughs> and what that means to me, as, as I nibble at this fantastically great problem, is that I'm going to read everything I think I ought to have read. One of the things that's characteristic in this culture is if a book is very important, we don't read it. You know, who, who's read Capital? Who's read Marx? You know, Marxists didn't read him. You know, um, who's, you know, people actually reading the Bible in a, a meaningful sense. That, that's surprisingly rare. People that are actually willing to take it on as it is, as a, a great ancient literature, you know, rather than something that, that justifies prejudices and narrow behavior, which it really doesn't. Um, this, this is the sort of thing, I, I simply wanted to know what it is assumed that one knows, and then some more beside. And then I owe it all to my English teacher in high school. I'm attached to something at this table, so I'm not going to move. Uh, <laughs> so don't feel like you have to turn around and look at me. It's OK. You can look at the people who are here to see you. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the fear essay. You, you touch on guns mm -hmm. in that essay. Um, you say gun sales stimulate gun sales, a splendid business model, no doubt about that. Fear operates as an appetite or an addiction. You can never be safe enough. You write, our appetite for weapons is one of those vacuums nature hates, that is to say, fills. So how, in your mind, did God and guns 
get sort of mixed up together in the minds of some Americans? Um, well, you know, we've had the development of a kind of, of, of group self-righteousness that uh, is very ready to find threat and to find enemies. Um, and, you know, it's just a matter of American cultural history that uh, people like to think that God is on their side. And, uh, you know, the combined effect of, of uh, God and weaponry makes you a formidable figure. I don't know. It, it, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really appalling to me. That's one of the things that is hard for me to deal with, the fact that, that I find major trends in the culture actually repulsive. The idea that people dressing in the morning will put on a concealed weapon in case the circumstance of maiming or killing should arise for them. That's already such a huge declension from civilized standards that I can hardly believe it happens. You talk about sitting, you write about, I should say, talk, um, sitting on your, on your porch at home and hearing a neighbor talking about packing heat uh, on the way to the grocery store, I think. Talk, talk about that moment a little bit. Well, it was very strange, you know. I don't think it was a neighbor. I, there are certain woods behind my house. I think it was uh, to someone who happened to be taking a shortcut or so. Although he was speaking to someone he knew, someone who knew him, more crucially. Uh, apparently, this uh, person had carried a, a gun, a large gun, openly into a convenience store. And the manager had called the police. And given, you know, given what we get as a dose of reality in the daily news, it's not surprising the manager called the police. The man carrying the gun was very upset because he said it was legally registered, you know. But then, you know, Adam Lanza's guns were registered and this fellow Paddock's guns were registered. It's, it's, that is obviously not an effective criterion at all. What do you think uh, we get wrong about the Midwest or the Middle West in the way we speak and the way we write? What, what do people misunderstand about the Midwest? I think that, uh, I think a lot of Middle Westerners have bought into the idea that everything has occurred elsewhere and that, that you know, and the things of the highest quality occur elsewhere, um, either the East, the West Coast, or Europe. Um, you know, and this, this is a very strange thing. I looked up the Pulitzer Prize, as a matter of fact, and, and found that something like nine of the first 11 Pulitzer Prizes went to people from the Middle West, writing about it. Um, that's an, a, phen a phenomenal literary culture in a newly settled region, you know, and it, um, there was a, a very uh, systematic sort of migration into this part of the world by people who wanted to start colleges. We can all tell that by looking around. The only, I mean, they, they themselves were highly educated people with ambitious ideas of what education is and what it can accomplish. Um, I spent a lot of time reading in the 19th century. It happened that uh, it happened that a minister that I knew showed up at the door with a book by Harriet Beecher Stowe about our self-made men, and so I read it, and it uh, named a lot of people I'd never heard of before, who came into the Middle West or were born here, and created. Uh, all kinds of interesting social reform and social institutions, and who were very, very, very effective opposition to the institution of slavery. Um, the Middle West carried the Union cause for years uh, in the Civil War at great cost. Um, it's, it's simply a, a rich area full of premier institutions with a very, impressive history. And, and uh, 
the fact that people sort of act as if they are somehow less enabled culturally than other people, and they do. They do. I watch that. I'm an outsider, so I get to say, yes, this is true. Uh, and in a way, sort of reinforce this myth uh, that this is the place where nothing happened. This is the place where people are conventional and slow-minded. You hear that? It's very, you know, when I, I go somewhere, people only know I'm from Iowa, a writer from Iowa. They, they define complex words for me. And then I, I fret about the memory for years afterward. Uh, but, you know, this, I'm not saying, no region has any exclusive claim on anything. But there's a lot we could learn about American culture and institutions by being aware that so many of them came from here, that they were highly idealistic projects at the beginning, highly fruitful, and, and very, very, very much worth remembering. And, and retaining. I want to talk about something that President Obama said to you during his interview of you. Uh, when I think about how I understand my role as citizen, setting aside being president, and the most important set of understandings that I bring to that position of citizen, the most important stuff I've learned, I think I've learned from novels. So I wonder what are some novels that have shaped your understandings? Well, when I, it, it, when I uh, think about what I, to whom I am indebted, the American 19th century is overwhelmingly uh, where my imagination came from, you know, and then I hope I have supplemented it variously. Um, but things like Moby Dick, you know, well, there's nothing like Moby Dick. Moby Dick. Uh, and, and then people like Emily Dickinson and so on. That, that period where they were working through what are really epistemological questions about the relationship of language to thought and the relationship of language to perception and so on. Um, I think that we underread them because we assume that they're not up to anything quite so ambitious. But they are, and nobody's ever done it better. What, what are you reading right now? Uh, <laughs> at the moment, I'm reading William of Ockham on the Nature of Tyranny. <laughs> I read widely. <laughs> I'm very interested. I love, I've gotten farther and farther into, you know, very old literature because I find that, that it's been a tendency in modern thought to narrow the vocabulary of understanding. And when you go back, even if people are making interesting mistakes, you know, they're doing it in, you know, with interesting penumbra of ideas around the, the error and the rest of it. Um, and I find that, I, I've had a feeling for a long time that when I read contemporary thinking on most subjects, I feel as though I am being taken down a narrow path that is growing narrower, you know? And uh, reading, reading anything pre-modern sort of uh, complicates the uh, ecology of ideas in a way that I find very pleasing. I think we're getting close to the audience question time. I just want to read one more quote of yours that I love <clears throat> and ask you to, to talk a little bit about it. Abuse or neglect of a human being is not the destruction of worth, but certainly the denial of it. Worth. We're always trying to anchor meaning in experience. But without the concept of worth, there's no concept of meaning. I cannot make a dollar worth a dollar. I have to trust that it is worth a dollar. I can't make a human being worthy of my respect. I have to assume that he is worthy of my respect. I, I love that, and I wonder if, um, if you could share your thoughts on, on how we move more toward 
a culture that, that does that for each other? Um, well, you know, that I think that this society moves collectively in an odd way. I mean, I think that the less, exp the more we adopt each other's language, the more we adopt each other's assumptions, the narrower the whole vocabulary of discussion becomes. So that there are these binary oppositions and so on that are simplifications of issues to which we are nevertheless loyal on one side or the other and so on. Um, I think that we have not been doing much to remind ourselves of the importance of human beings, of the fantastic potential of any human mind, you know? Um, we, we speak of people uh, en masse and without great respect for them even, you know, I mean, the, 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 again, to return to what I was saying before, the, the term heartland is pretty well full of contempt, you know? It's, the heartland is where people don't think new thoughts, etc. you know? Um, we have these terms, these dismissive terms for talking about people in general. And if you do that, you have lowered your expectations of any person in particular. You've lowered your definition of what a human being is. Um, we have to, I think, realize the poverty of a lot of our thinking and, and uh, you know, discover a way back to a fuller sense of, of what we are. One of the things that is, you know, I, I read a lot of, I read, you know, cosmologies and so on that are accessible to me, you know, the new science, new physics and all that. And um, more and more I have become aware of what an utterly exceptional thing it is to have this tiny livable planet that not, I mean, is minute, is inconsiderable by the scale of the universe and at the same time knows the universe in that haunting way, you know, sends out these little sort of surrogate eyes, you know, and senses to, to understand this utterly other reality that we are, you know, a, a, a tiny little jewel in the middle of, not in the middle of, on the peripheries of, who knows. But in any case, uh, you know, the, given the utter uncanny strangeness of the human circumstance and the fact that even though we're continuously talking about how many people there are, they are nothing by the scale of the universe. We're a tiny, fragile little group, you know. Um, I, th I think we have to re remember that there's a brilliant, strange uh, reality around us that, ha that, if you think about it, has the effect of incredibly enhancing the, our, our wonder at the human presence, you know. And then, of course, we do wrong and get on each other's nerves and pose terrible danger to, to ourselves. Nothing else threatens us the way we do. But I think that the change would be realizing the utter preciousness of, of human beings, you know, of what's possible, what is true. So, I'm in a pulpit, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's a lovely way to end our portion and throw this over to the audience who I'm sure is Itching to ask you questions. Uh, I think someone's gonna walk around with a mic. Is it the mic I'm holding? Okay. <laughs> so hang on one second. Hi. Um, uh, sorry. Thank you so much for writing. Uh, the biggest difference that I see between housekeeping and the Dil Gilead trilogy that I can pin down is that in housekeeping there are some people like Lucille and Ruth upstore neighbors at their mother's house or some of the more conventional people around Fingerbone that seem maybe a little bit absurd, maybe a little bit petty, maybe a little bit silly. In the Gilead trilogy, even the people that tunnel and the horse falls into it and the people that kind of like annoy Lila because they keep coming around, all of them seem to have this really great intent 
are. They seem to be genuinely kind, but maybe misled or just not thinking. I, I was wondering if, uh, did something uh, change between house, any bill and housekeeper times? I was wondering if anything changed between the Ilya trilogy about how either you think about human dignity in general or how you relate to characters and how you kind of like try to represent them. Because even the small people in the Gilead trilogy seem to have a dignity that uh, I, I can't quite think of another author that can capture. Oh, well, <clears throat> I think that the people, the, you know, finger bone people get misread. I spent quite a bit of time in that book saying that they understood absolutely why Sylvie would be inclined toward the dark woods, you know, that they understood the transiency of their, you know, their, I mean, it's because they understand how transient their little society is that they cling to it the way that they do, you know. Um, I'm sorry if it seemed, if I'm sorry if that seemed to be true. Uh, it wasn't anything that I would have thought of doing intentionally. I thought of the, of everything on a spectrum in housekeeping and that the settledness is a reaction to the transiency which is a reaction to the settledness you know um, I think that most people feel their lives in terms of what they have uh, decided against and uh, in if you are domesticated you realize you've given up freedom and if you're free in that way you realize you've given up comfort and uh, the, com the complexity of a mind comes from the fact that possibilities that were rejected remain live as thoughts as impulses Hi, Marilyn. Yes. Um, welcome from another Iowan. Um, Thanks. In the vein of belief, um, I think it's really important to have belief in ourselves as people. And I'm wondering if you always believed in your talent or if at what point you gained that belief. You know, I never really thought about it. I mean, what? People, when I was a kid, people told me that I wrote well, you know, and, or I did well on standardized tests that involved language. Um, I had no conception of becoming a writer. I always assumed that I would write things. I thought housekeeping was unpublishable, which was a part of the joy of writing it. Um, I don't think in terms of those categories particularly, and I, I didn't want nobody ever, you know, Nobody particularly in, pushed me in one direction or another. I just like to write, and so I write. Hi, thank you. Um, when the character Jack in the novel Home wants a blessing from his father, and he asks, bless me also, were you intending to have him anticipate that his father would respond the way that he did, and is that part of a meditation on your part about predestination? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'm interested in predestination because I think it misstates reality. Um, I think that it's an idea that, which occurs from St. Augustine on, you know, it's a very characteristic uh, idea in Christian theology. Um, and I think it's because they did not understand the nature of time or they used shorthand for it, you know. Um, but his father, Jack's father, really loves him and has spent his whole theological career forgiving him. Um, but he misses, he misunderstands Jack. And that means that there's a sort of an awkwardness and ineptitude in his most generous and refined efforts to assure Jack of the fact that he is accepted, you know. Um, that's just a moment where things just kind of went wrong, you know. Um, people misread also uh, Jack Bouton's father, 
who they they read him as being rigid and unforgiving, and in fact, he's only forgiving. There is never a moment in which he condemns anything that Jack does. As a former high school English teacher, I was curious about your statement of the impact of your uh, English teacher. Can you share with us some of her words of wisdom or strategies or methodologies that inspired you? Well, you know, frankly, uh, she wasn't such a great teacher. <laughs> she, I, I've thought about her because she's a, she was a very tentative presence in the classroom. It always seemed like you, if you said boo, she'd run out the door, you know? Um, but she did say things, I mean, she said another thing that impressed me very much. She was a very pious woman. And she said, we, the, America is rich because God can entrust us to share wealth. And the moment we stop sharing wealth, we will cease to be rich. And I think that those might be words that one could well ponder. Um, my question is very simple. What's the state of your hopefulness in our current predicament? <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't, I mean, I've, I've read enough history to know that history takes some very disturbing turns, which uh, how, how collective behavior relates to individual behavior, you know, or, or I mean, I'm reading in the, in the 14th and 15th centuries now, and the, which were absolutely appalling centuries. I mean, warfare, famine, plague, you know, everything that you can think of. And the people writing then, whose works have survived in any case, are this, the sweetest spirits you could ever imagine, you know? Um, and how they, I mean, they're, they, they tend toward a, some a kind of ecstatic tendency toward mysticism, but it's not really mysticism. They tended to be people that were speaking to uh, uneducated people in their own language, with German or Czech or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, it would be very hard for me to look at the period during which America fell down fortunate and find anything so humane as you find among these people who were writing in conditions of unbelievable difficulty. So one thing that my hope is based on is that the people who gave lasting gift to the world were always hopeful under circumstances that I hope we will never see anything to that would compare. I mean, it's human beings that are the impressive thing, even though collectively they go haywire from time to time. I have a question about Iowa. Uh, just wondering, is there something special about that as a place in the Midwest when it comes to themes that you write about, or is that just the place you know so your novels could be set anywhere? Well, uh, there's a special history behind Gilead. You know, I mean, uh, President Grant did indeed call Iowa the shining star of radicalism. Um, it was extremely reformist, extremely abolitionist. It, the reason that Jack comes home is because uh, Iowa never had laws against miscegenation. The only other state that didn't is Maine. And so, you know, he has, he, he's deeply in love with, had made a family with a woman that it is, a, he, you know, he can't marry legally. And the cohabitation of unmarried people was also illegal at that time. So, so his life is completely disrupted by these, uh, these things that should not be true. You know, and if he went back to Iowa, it should be true, 
that he could live there with his family and as a married household and so on. When he goes home, and this is historically how things were, uh, that culture had made concessions to, to uh, you know, Jim Crow that made it so what was true on the books was not true in fact. And so no one can guarantee him that yes, indeed, his family can live as an intact family. Um, so those are special circumstances for Iowa. The memory of a very radical history as far as abolition and reform are concerned. And that layered over by a broader conventionalism uh, that people are not, you know, they're not entirely at ease with and not free from at all. There is so much in your work about the relationship between parents and children and the love of parents which is peppered by brutality and misunderstanding and absence and struggle and some of it some of this difficulty seems incredibly generative and some seems destructive in very complicated ways and I'm just wondering how your own parents live in your novels, where they appear as ghosts. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, housekeeping is set in a place like the town where I was born and it, a house that was oddly like my grandmother's house where my mother grew up. Um, but aside from physical details like that, it's not autobiographical. Nothing that I've written was ever intentionally autobiographical. If it is, it is so oblique that, you know, my own brother doesn't recognize it. <laughs> I have a, you know, I don't understand, I, I don't want to make a case for it or anything, but I have a, what is simply a, you know, a temperamental resistance to seeing myself on my own pages. What is your reflection on the racial dynamics of our society today, uh, Black Lives Matter, identity politics, and kind of most importantly, how to move forward and truly make greater progress in that area? You know, I, th I think that the, the, the uh, standard that needs to be applied is fair is fair, you know? I mean, you read about things that in the Jim Crow period, there, the person that comes up in, in Gilead, Bud Fowler, uh, he was a fantastically um, skillful baseball player, you know? Um, there, you know, is one of those people you just wish you could see. And this is not, I think, accidentally related to the fact that he ended up in the Negro Leagues, that the Negro Leagues functioned as a catchment for people like him who were simply so conspicuously great at what they did, you know? I mean, when you read, when you read the racial history of the states after the Civil War, especially, you know, after, during Reconstruction, after Reconstruction, um, what happens over and over again is that the, the, you know, the gifts of non-white people are resisted and dismissed and unvalued, you know. And the way, I mean, I'm old, you know, so that I can say when I was a kid, you virtually never saw or you never heard of, of the voice of a black person speaking on the radio, you know, that the culture was so suppressed that people did not have any realistic notion of what people were actually capable of. And as in the case of Bud Fowler and other people who, who lived in that period before Jim Crow and after the Civil War, uh, you see them being in effect excluded in, for all appearances on the basis of having, having gifts and enviable skills. So I think that, I mean, you, you hear like Black Lives Matter, you know, 
Uh, if, if it's true that black people are disproportionately likely to uh, be shot on traffic stops and so on, then the simple standard of fairness is not being applied. And that old tendency uh, is not gone. The amount of mobility that is denied to people who can't assume their safety is a huge loss and the kind of thing that necessarily embitters relations. How could it not? You know? I mean, there's no magic wand, there's no, but there is that fine old standard, you know, if somebody does something well, means well, is not violating any norm that you would find offensive in your children or your brother, respect that, you know? I mean, it's almost too simple a formula, but it's too consistently not honored. I remember when Marian Anderson could not sing in the White House. That was Eisenhower. I mean, just bizarre. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, for sharing your stories and helping so many people feel warm in your midst. My question is, here in Evanston, I work as a mental health therapist in our public school, working with elementary kids, and we have a uh, college-ready gap that's been around for 30 years between our white students and our students of color. And my question is, any thought or reflection on how we could in Evanston to help minimize that gap and to help some of our middle school students of color really feel warm in literature and get excited about reading and writing? Well, you know, uh, one, one thing that I think is hopeful uh, at the workshop in Iowa where I, where I have been teaching, uh, we have a lot of black and Caribbean writers coming through who are just excellent. Um, and I think, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't diversify our student body for a long time because we didn't get any applicants. You know, you, you, can't, you can't accept people that don't apply. Now we have a lot of applicants and we have a lot of, of these uh, students and residents, many of them from the Caribbean, from anywhere. And uh, I think that one of the things that uh, will make future minority students more receptive to literature is that literature has been more receptive to them, you know. Um, I think we have to be very, very cautious about things like college readiness, you know, because so often we can be picking up signals and so on that, uh, that we interpret in inappropriate ways. Uh, I think that, I mean, you know, things like uh, the overpopulation of uh, students of color in, uh, you know, special education courses and so on. I, I don't believe that that's legitimate by any means. Uh, and I, I don't know how this entrapment occurs. But I think that things like that, not to give the kids ahead of time the idea that they don't belong in higher education or they wouldn't understand literature. I, you know, it's a terrible thing. I, one of the interesting experiences that I've had was uh, being taken home in a taxi by a, a black fellow who said that he had spent years in Attica. Uh, it was a long ride, and I thought, well, that's interesting information. No, but in any case, no, he was a wonderful fellow, though, and, and he said he did not know the world was anything he could be interested in. And then he read a book. And I think we absolutely have to to develop any means we can to take, take people, all kinds of people, over that threshold. People don't know what books are until one of them has been claimed by a book, you know? Um, I don't think, I, you know, I just, I just don't think that uh, 
the problem is insoluble. I think that we're locked into cultural patterns that we can't find our way out of.